chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in the 26th verse, if you would, follow along with me. The scripture says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast into her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great. And he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered her and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage that we're going to be studying this morning. Father, I pray that in this hour, in this moment where we are afforded the privilege of studying your word, that we see the Lord Jesus Christ as central to this text, as central to this Bible, as central to our lives, and this hour of meeting together. Thank you for this time of the year when Christ should be central in all of our lives as we think about and ponder about what your entrance into the world meant for the redemption of all mankind. We celebrate that this morning, Father, your love and, and your work through your Son, Jesus. And we pray he is honored and glorified in our midst today. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I think we've, we're looking at a passage this morning that many here would quickly recognize as a familiar passage of Scripture, often looked at and read and heard during this time of the year. The time when the angel Gabriel came and announced to Mary that she would bring the Christ child into the world. Just to let you know um, kind of the order of events that I've got planned in my mind. We're going to be doing this one today, the announcement. We're going to be doing the actual birth narrative on Tuesday, Christmas Eve. And then we're going to be doing the wise men and the star next Sunday. So it's, it's in chronological order. So, let's begin. 26th verse. In the sixth month. Why does he say it that way? Well, the context here that we've just kind of jumped right in the middle of there and it says it towards the end of our section is that her cousin Elizabeth has been uh, carrying John the Baptist now for six months. Her cousin Elizabeth, so Jesus' cousin John the Baptist. They were related. But I actually want to go back and read a little bit of that text because I'm going to make some comparisons. Um, 
as we go through our text. So I want to go back and read quickly um, verses 11 through 20. So flip back the page. Let me just read that real quick. So this is talking about when the angel, the same angel, Gabriel, came and appeared to Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband. It says in verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now this is in the temple in Jerusalem. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice in his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit of the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God. I am sent to speak unto thee, and to show you these, the good, these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. All right, so that gives you a little bit of the back story. So in <coughs> verse 26, when it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now we know what the six months reference is there. So we also know that Gabriel was the same Gabriel, <coughs> the angel of God that was sent to Zechariah. What's different here, though, is it says that he was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, Dr. Luke here is pointing out that this place called Nazareth was an obscure village. It wasn't on any of the trade routes. Did you know that Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament at all? It's not written and mentioned in the Talmud at all, the Jewish writings. It's not mentioned in the writings of Josephus at all. And the word city there, city of Galilee named Nazareth, is a little bit misleading because that word in the Greek just means a place where some people lived as opposed to being absolutely rural and rugged. They estimate that probably about 200 people lived in Nazareth at this time. In the Old Testament, Galilee is referred to in the book of Isaiah as being on the edge of the nation of Israel. It's actually called Galilee of the Nations. It's, it's the, the last point that you can be in and still be in Israel. If you go beyond that, you're in Unclean land. But in Isaiah 9, it said that the great light would first appear to those people. Great promise to us as Gentiles. But this promise is not only to the Jew, it's to the Gentile as well. Let's go on, verse 27 came to this obscure little village and put Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. <coughs> so Luke doesn't give us a lot of background on this person Mary. It says that she was espoused. Of course that means engaged. And it's a little different than the engagement we've talked about this before uh, in our culture. In our culture, uh, you know, we have the engagement period and then you have the wedding. In the Jewish culture, the, when you were engaged, you were actually legally husband and wife. 
but you still had not had the formal ceremony of the wedding. So during that, that period of time, the custom was that the, the, the husband was preparing to bring his wife to his house, have the, the ceremony, and then live together from that point on. So during that period of time, even though they were considered husband and wife, there was no relationships, no sexual relationship between the, the parties. So, now John, when he writes his gospel, he uses this lofty language to talk about how Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Luke's a doctor. He's a practical every day, deals with patients. So we're going to see how Luke talks about the deity of Jesus Christ. He does it twice in this verse alone. There is something that really jumps out about this verse in his description of this young lady. He calls her a virgin twice. <laughs> you see that? Twice. And that word is very precise in the Greek. It's parthenos. And there is no, absolutely no ambiguity about what that word means. As a doctor, he uses that word specifically to say, absolutely without a shadow of doubt, this woman of probably 13 to 16 years old, most scholars believe, had never had intimate sexual relations. She was a virgin. Never had those kind of relationships doctor told us twice. Very important. No uncertain terms. We're about to see something amazing. Amazing. Verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, Thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So apparently she was inside of, of either her home or a home, and the angel came inside the home. So I'm going to just kind of put this in the vernacular. Here's how I wrote it out. The gay angel Gabriel comes in and says, Hello, Mary. The Lord identifies you as his servant and has chosen you among women to do something special for him. Does that make sense? Just plain and simple. Hello, hail is the same as saying hello. The Lord has chosen you to do something special. Verse 29, And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. This is not a, at all an unusual reaction. I, mean, I could take you to several other places. Isaiah 6, 5, Luke 5, 8. When sinners who recognize themselves as sinners, believers in God, see angels or see God for the first time, see Jesus in all his glory, they are shocked. They're in fear. They are trembling. They are, many are prostrate. Many, uh, they're, they're scared. You would be, I would be. So this is a normal reaction. She's trembling. When you see Gabriel, and he's, I love the way he says it when he's talking to Zachariah back in, in verse 19. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I love that answer. What happens when you stand in the presence of God? You glow. We know that from Moses in the Old Testament, right? Moses came down off the mountain and all the children of Israel were saying, Put something over your face, Moses. We can't look at you. Because he had been so close to God, right? Can you imagine angels 
who we're told in um, Matthew chapter, where is it? Did I write down the reference? I did. I think it's Matthew 13, 16, somewhere in there. 16. It says that angels are always in the presence of God, beholding the face of God, waiting for orders. That's what angels do. And we know from other passages like Isaiah 6 that while they're there, they're praising God, they're worshiping, they're burning because of that reflection. Not burning up, but burning with glory and light. They're waiting to be dispatched and sent on orders for God and for us. was a natural reaction that she has here. Verse 29. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. When an angel comes and the, the purpose of the visit is not judgment, it's blessing or information, and the person is a believer, the first thing the angel always says is fear not. They seek to calm, they realize and recognize the effect that their presence is having on the individual. And they are seeking to calm the person from their fears. So we all get the context of what's going on here. So we have this angel coming to deliver this message. We've been told who this person is. We've been told where she's from, what the circumstances are. Now we get the message, right? This is what we've been waiting for. Verses 31, 32, and 33. Gabriel is going to tell us the reason, the purpose, why he's been sent to Mary. Isn't that easy to figure out? I, you didn't need me to tell you that. We, we read the passage. Now we're, we're walking our way through it. Is there anyone in this room that didn't kind of track along and figure out that that's where we're at so far? I don't think. I didn't think so. I didn't think you'd jump up and tell me if you did. But I, I said it that way for a purpose. And, and I want to be careful before I, I go into this little next section because I wanted to do this on purpose. I'm going to take about five minutes here and talk about something that has nothing to do with what the point of the story is. The reason why I said it the way I just said it. There are, there are all kinds of churches out there that teach all kinds of different things. And most of churches, you know, you would hope to think that they're pretty straight line about how they present the gospel and how they teach from the word of God and and there's no guarantee that any church, even a Baptist church, is doing it all right. And we, we hope that as we follow the scriptures, we're going to be going, you know, pretty close, tight to where we're supposed to be teaching and what we're teaching. Uh, we all agree that this is our authority. Amen. It's not me. It's not our church. It's not our denomination. It's, it's this. So even if, if we're tracking along here going through Scripture and you've studied this passage and you come to a different conclusion about some things, that's okay. And we can even debate some things. And we do. And we should. Iron sharpens iron, right? I, I, just because I'm up here in this place doesn't mean I'm always right. It just means I've studied it and been asked to bring a message. That's all. So iron sharpens iron. But... There are some denominations that have gone off the rails in different directions through the centuries since the church came on this planet. And one of my jobs is to expose falsehoods. It's not the part of my job that I enjoy the most, but it's important. It's important for us to know when we hear falsehoods. Amen? We, we need to highlight them and say, that's wrong for whatever reason. 
and it needs to come from here. The reason I said all that is because my wife and I have uh, relatives that are in the Roman Catholic Church. And just because you're a Roman Catholic doesn't mean you're not a believer. I don't believe that. I would hope that there are a lot of believers in the Roman Catholic Church. But the Roman Catholic Church as an institution has some serious things wrong. And I'm about to expose one right here. And we just all agree that the natural progression of how this passage comes down is it's giving you the backdrop of what's coming to the really important part is verses 31 through 33. We all agree with that, right? For the Roman Catholic, the most important verse in this entire passage is verse 28. Look at it again. I'll give you just a second to read it again. Maybe one of the most important verses in all the Bible for a Roman Catholic. They call it by a particular name. It's called the Ave Maria. The Hail Mary. You ever heard of it by that term before? Now, you may have heard it in some different circles. The Hail Mary, just like the Our Father, are the two Catholic rote prayers that they say all the time. They say that when they pray their rosaries, they say them when they are doing penance after confession. The, the, pre, the priest will, you know, you'll, you'll tell the priest what all you did wrong that week, that day, or that year, depending on when the last time you was there. And he will give you instructions. Okay, say five our fathers and four uh, Hail Marys. And that will take care of your, your penance. You ever heard those terms before? Okay. And it always is, is framed around, here's how it goes. I actually wrote it down. It goes like this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most of that comes from this verse right here. One line of it comes from uh, verse... 48, and that is called the Magnificat, and that's also a very significant passage in the Roman Catholic understanding. So I grew up thinking that the Hail Mary was a pass that you threw in football right before the end of the game to try to get a touchdown to win the game. Apparently, the Hail Mary to the Roman Catholics is the most important thing that there is. Because, see, their understanding of the Hail Mary is based on this verse, it actually comes from a wrong interpretation from the, the Latin Vulgate, where it says highly favored there in verse 28. What that means to you and me in our normal understanding of reading the scriptures, that means God has poured out His grace on you. He's chosen you to do something. Right? We all see that? Somehow or another, they flip it around completely there. And instead of Mary being a recipient of God's grace, she became the dispenser of it. She becomes the giver of it. Now picture this. Here's how a Catholic believes you get to heaven. You got this big bucket over here. And you got to put grace in it. And, the, and you got to fill up this bucket and get the most grace you can in order to be able to get the most points to be able to get through Peter's gate. And the most grace that you can possibly put in that bucket comes from Mary. Because Mary has the most grace to give, according to Catholic doctrine, doxology, dogma. Now, there's lots of different ways to get grace. To put in this bucket, you get grace by um, getting married. That's one of the sacraments, supposedly, that you get some grace for. 
we get grace for doing communion at the uh, at Catholic masses. You can do one every day, so you can get grace every day. Put in that bucket. You get grace for doing good works. You get grace for uh, going to confession. So I'm not sure all the different ways that you can get grace, but the, the point is to be able to give. Get that bucket full. And depending on where you're at in that bucket depends on where you go when you die. You know, if you're if you're up here, you, you might get into heaven. And if you're down here, you, you may go into purgatory. And if you're down here, you go to heaven. You, you probably hear a little sarcasm in my voice. None of that's true, beloved. Let me read you something I, I just read while I was doing this. This comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Finally, the petition, Holy Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at our death. Amen. States the official catechism of the Council of Trent to have been framed by the church itself. Most rightly, says the catechism, as the Holy Church of God added to this thanksgiving, petition also, and the invocation of the, of the Most Holy Mother of God, thereby implying that we should piously and suppliantly have recourse to her in order that her intercession, by her intercession, she may reconcile God with us sinners and obtain for us the blessing we need, both for this present life and the life which has no end. That's from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Beloved, that's blasphemy. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. That's it. There is no other way. If you're relying on me in any way to get you into heaven, you're you're, you're, you're not going to get there. If you're relying on Mary in any way to get you to heaven, you're not going to get there. There is only one mediator between God and Mary. Christ Jesus. And that is who we are going to leave all this for right now and look at square on in the face. The face of Christ Jesus. Now I hope that doesn't distract too much. But I think it's important to know some of those things. Now again, just like when I talk about the next Catholic you meet on the street, I just want you to be a little more informed where they're coming from. But don't start out your conversation with, if you believe in praying to Mary to get you into heaven, you're going to hell. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Don't tell them that I told you to do that. That, that will not win over that person to Christ. Amen? Amen. But we need to understand where they're coming from. All right, let's go on. So now the important part of why Gabriel has come. Start off with the first part of 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth the son. Conceive in thy womb and bring forth the son. And she understood this to be immediate. That he was telling her she is going to get pregnant, and have a child. And she is now thinking, okay, wow. He just blew her mind, and she wants to say some things, but he's still talking. So she's still listening. But now he knows why she's come to make this announcement. It doesn't fit anything. It, it's like a, a, a square peg in a round hole doesn't go with anything she understands to have. She, she knows what the birds and bees are. She knows how it works. She's very confused at this point. She's troubled and perplexed. But he goes on. Before she's able to voice any question, the angel continues with, he shall be called, you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. The 
Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. In a stunning, breathtaking summary, the angel Gabriel gives us the entire glory, glorious ministry of Jesus Christ. He covers his saving work, his righteous life, his deity, his resurrection, ascension, and glorious return are inferred, and then he ends up with his glorious kingdom rule, which melts into the eternal state of heaven. So let's unpack it a little bit. First, let's begin with the name, the name Jesus. The name Jesus literally translates to Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. And we know exactly, that's exactly what Jesus was sent to do. In Matthew 1.21, the angel tells Joseph that exact thing. You'll name your son Jesus because he came to take away the sins of the people. We know that he knew that that was his mission when he was here. Luke 19.10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then we also know that his parents were obedient to that very command. In Luke 2, 21, when they go to the ceremony to have their son named, they named their son Jesus. Jehovah saves. Then it says in verse 32, he should be great. And then just put a big period right there. Now, Contrast that with what Gabriel said about John back in verse 15 of chapter 1. For he should be great in the sight of the Lord. You see the difference? You could add on all the superlatives you could possibly, you know, tremendous, uh, glorious, uh, just, I, I, they would all fall short. Just go on and on and on. Because his greatness is intrinsic. It's in and of himself. His greatness doesn't depend on anything else. Like John's did, his greatness came from being God's servant. And sent to do God's will. Jesus is God. So his greatness is himself. Does that make sense? So he doesn't need anything else after that period. He shall be great. Period. He should be called the Son of the Highest. The Son of the Highest. The name that God is called most in the Bible is Elion, Most High God. The Greek translation of that is here. The highest. So Jesus is the son of the highest. And the way that that's worded, it doesn't just mean related. Like we are the sons of God. It means in essence and in nature when it talks about it here. Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, that's God's glory, and the express image of his person, upholds all things. By the word of his power. When you see Jesus, you see God. The image of God. He is the express image of his person. <coughs> the work of Jesus will be the central theme of the entire New Testament from this point on. We know all about what Jesus came to do and how he provided for salvation. And all that's inferred because the next thing he says is that the Lord God should give unto him the throne of his father David. We could take a lot of time and do this, but I just want to do it quickly. I don't think there's going to be any objection because I think most of you know this. It's, it's, it's an amazing fact of how Jesus is the legal heir of the throne of David through his adopted father, Joseph. 
If you take Matthew 1 and go all the way through the lineage of Joseph, you end up back at David. And Jesus is the legal adopted son. And he, therefore, has the right to the throne of David through his father. And then you have the blood of David that gets to him through the other avenue, which is his earthly mother, where he gets his humanity. So through both parents, he's actually a son of David. By one, he has the legal right to the throne, and by the other, he gets the blood of David. Does that make sense? So that's why he is... And then you can go through lots and lots of really, really cool stuff to find out why. Why isn't there a king there now? Why wasn't there a king after they came back from Babylon? And, and the curse of Jehoiachin and all these different really cool things to go all the way through to find out why Jesus is the next king that will sit on the throne. Not going to be another king. Until Christ Jesus sets on the throne. And it will be the throne of David during the millennial king. So then we know that he says here, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. So we have that, that Jewish feel of the millennial kingdom we've been talking so much about in Zechariah. But then it goes and adds that little last tag, forever, has no end. And we know how that all mailed, melts right into eternity. There's not going to be an end to the reign of Jesus. There's a set time on the earth when he reigns on that millennial kingdom for 1,000 years. But that doesn't end his reign. After the rebellion, it goes right on into eternity. New heaven, new earth, new creation. That doesn't end. So we have the entire ministry of Jesus laid out for us in three verses. So I guess Gabriel took a breath at that point. That's a mouthful. So it, it gives Mary a chance to ask this question. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, I want you to see a big difference here between her question after the, the statement of Gabriel and Zachariah's question. Let me read verse 20 for you again in chapter... One. After Gabriel, Gabriel says, I am Gabriel, stand to the presence of God, and sent to speak unto thee. Verse 20 says, Behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. What's the next line? Because thou believest not my words. <coughs> he didn't believe the angel. He didn't believe the angel. He said, your wife is going to be bearing a son in her old age, and you fathering a child in your old age. He didn't believe it. So we all know the story. Zachariah was made dumb. He couldn't talk again until that ceremony when they had to name John. And he was already told what to name him, and he wrote his name down because he couldn't talk. And as soon as he named his son like he was told to do, he was able to talk again. So what's the difference between her question, his question, and her question? Her question is not an unbelief. Her question is a process question. How does this happen? She believes God can do this. She just doesn't know how. She knows the birds and bees. She knows how it all works. And she knows that part's never happened to her. So how can that happen? Does that make sense? He wants to know how practically it's going to be implemented. So Gabriel answers, verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's a powerful verse. That's a powerful verse. So here's what it's saying. <laughs> All right, Mary. I wonder if he said it sarcastically. No, I'm sure he did. He was very serious and very pious when he said it. Mary, you know how Genesis 1, 2 said, and, and 
God said the, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and was involved in everything in creation, that Spirit of God, the one who was the active agent in making everything that's ever been made, the whole universe, and, and if that's not enough, Mary, that Spirit of God that's the active agent that made everything will also be overshadowed by the Most High God. Person one and person two of the Trinity will be actively working on your behalf here to make this child in you. Basically what he's saying is, Mary, Mary, if your God can make everything that is, everywhere, the farthest star that you can see, the deepest ocean that you can see, Mary, he can put a child in your belly. And because he can do that, he can make a special child, a unique child. A child that shares his essence and that will be holy, pure, without sin. Now, I know some preachers go on some weird tangents here, and I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying I don't know where in Scripture it's backed up. And let me tell you what I mean by that. You may have even heard this in Baptist circles. Some will say something along this line here at this point. They'll say, well... The reason why he's holy here is because he doesn't have an earthly father. And all sin is translated through the, the seed of the father. And since he bypassed the seed of the father, he's, he's holy because he doesn't have an earthly father. It sounds plausible. It sounds reasonable. I just, I, I don't know where that's at. I don't have a chapter and verse for that. So I, I can't land there. What I can tell you is, if, if the Holy Spirit and the Father are creating something, they can create anything they want. Amen? And they're creating the God-man that's human because he's born of Mary, and God because he's fathered by the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be holy, pure, without sin, without blemish. Now, we know, we do know, that all production of a human with a human father and mother always produces what? A sinner. Now, I can show you that. I can show you that in Scripture. Where if you have a human mother and a human father, the byproduct of that when it makes a child is always, always going to be a sinner. Amen. Right? We can agree on that one. But the technical reason... Scripturally, why Jesus is without sin, all I can tell you is because God made it that way. I can't give you a chapter and verse that says anything different. All right, that's enough on that. Let's move on. This here is the important part. Verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she had also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So she didn't ask for any extra she believed already she believed already but God gave her this gracious sign to help her to see and understand what he was doing he gave her this sign so apparently she didn't know at this point because it's six months into it but she doesn't know she lives in Nazareth 100 miles away she hasn't heard the news yet that Elizabeth her cousin cousin is with child. So God gives her this because she's going to have a lot of stuff to deal with. As this young 13 to 16 year old Jewish woman who is now going to be found with child outside of natural relations. She's going to have the stigma to deal with. She's going to have the explanation of talking to Joseph to deal with going to have the synagogue reputation to deal with. She's going to have a lot of stuff on her plate. Not only the, oh, the big thing. Yeah, the big thing. i got to raise God. Yeah, that, that, that little thing too. Yeah. That probably, that probably hasn't hit her at this point yet, but it's going to within the next day or two, right? Or maybe it has. Alright, then let's see her, her response. 
verse 38. Uh, verse 37, with God nothing shall be impossible. Gabriel reinforces that. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. What a great response. Amen. Amen. Don't you wish that you and I responded that way every time God ever asked us to do anything? So there it is. The pre-Christmas story. I have one application. One application today. So, we see a story here. You know, Baptists have this, and I've done this in the past too, Baptists have this, um, because of the way the, the Roman Catholics venerate Mary, Baptists almost have this pushback to where we make Mary nothing. And that's not true, is it? Mary was faithful. Mary was a, an obedient servant. Mary did what was asked for. Mary is an example in the Bible of great faith. And active faith, living faith. And I'm looking forward to seeing Mary and getting to talk with her and getting to know her and find out all that was going through her mind here. I can't imagine. So while we don't venerate Mary, we also do uh, lift her up as a, as a sister. But also admire her for her, her walk and, and, and the things that she accomplished on God's behalf. But the active agent in all this is her, the highest. Eliana. Here's my one point today. While we don't see these miracles of this sort being played out, we don't get these visitations from God. We don't get Gabriel standing before us saying, I am Gabriel, I just came from the presence of God. Well, that would be a shocker. And I'm actually glad I don't get to see that one. Yeah, I... Here's the point. God is still accomplishing his redemptive purposes like he did through Mary then same way today and doing the same creative works through humble obedient servants today. When you and I are humble and obedient in our walk with the Lord, first of all, there was an act of creation on yours and my part or to us, I should say, when we got saved. When we were humble and obedient for the very first time, like Mary was, God did a creative work and he made you a new creature in Christ. Did you know that that was a creative work? That was an act of creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anybody be in Christ, he is a new creation. God did a whole brand new thing in you and I the day we got saved. Amen. So he's still doing acts of creation when he sees humble, obedient servants. And then he uses those humble, obedient servants to make more of those new creations. Amen. So for to you and me today, I hope that we can take away from this place today. The Christmas story has that light living on through it. God is still doing this redemptive work, and he's still looking for humble, obedient servants like Mary to do his work. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessedness of this young, teenage, Jewish young lady, the example that we get to see and the, the courage that she had to stand up against culture and to do what was right because you asked her to do it. Because she was your servant. And you used that humble young lady to bring into this world the most amazing thing that we've ever had happen to humanity. The Savior, the Messiah, your Son third person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, came into the world through her. Thank you for that example. Thank you for that inspiration that as we go through this Christmas season, we can remember you're still doing acts of creation today. We pray that you do one here today. We'd love to see it here among our, our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you need to respond to today's message in any way, we invite you to come as we stand.